Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to What is America to You? I'm your host, Derek Dempsey, and we're coming at you from New York. Before we begin, and before I introduce you to our next guest, an incredible guest, an honor for me, let me tell you, and I'll explain in a moment why, we would ask you to subscribe to our channel and to give us a like and continue commenting in the videos. Okay, our next guest is a singer, songwriter, actor, producer, big band leader, and author. He's also uh, got his name on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He has had two number one billboard smash hits, one under his own name, and one by the great Dolly Parton. A brilliant song that I never knew until we spoke. Uh, I've really got a feeling, classic song, I love Dolly Parton. He uh, also has a new book out, which we're gonna speak about, Rip It Up, the specialty records story. So his songs have been sung, by everybody, but I'll just give you a few names. Uh, Dolly Parton, Tom, Tom Jones, Fats Domino, Lou Raw, Michael Bublé, and Eric Burton and Fats Domino. So you know we're gonna speak to a legend. So without further ado, he wrote this great song called At This Moment, and in the song he said, I would subtract 20 years from my life, he said to the girl if she would stay. Well, honestly, I'm glad that she didn't stay because we got Billy Vera on and we're gonna have him for a long, long, long time. Billy Vera, welcome to What Is America With You. A great honor for us. Oh, thank you for having me, Derek. Absolute honor. Here. Yes. You know, by the way, today, as we record this uh, interview, it is the birthday of Robert Plant, who also recorded a song of mine called Don't Look Back. Wow, our Led Zeppelin fans will be delighted to know. See, this is what blows me away about you. Well, and this is a this is me as a fan speaking. Um, when I got your album, uh, Believe It or the Beaters, by request, the three songs that brought you you brought me through heartache with my first girlfriend. I felt as if you got it when you sang. You know, in in at this moment, um, as you you know, what what do you think? I'd raise my hand to you. It's like I, I love you so much. All I want to do is hold you. I mean, you would just, and the whole song is so conversational. It, it fools you into thinking that you are talking to me personally, which a are, are, are person we both love, Sinatra, had that great ability. And you're so it's versatile. It's a funny thing about that song that I never realized until 20 or 30 years later uh, on, on Facebook, a woman uh, friended me. And she said she was the granddaughter of one of the two songwriters of a song called Moonlight in Vermont, if you'll remember that. What a song. And she said, you know, my grandfather's song and your song at this moment have one thing in common. I said, what is that? She said, neither song contains any rhymes. And I said, really? I, I, I mean, I had been singing the song a thousand times and I never realized that I didn't write any rhymes in the song. And I never knew that until you told me. And anyway, I had read about Moonlight in Vermont, and I think it was originally written as a poem by a woman, and they adapted it. So I knew that, but not once until you told me did I know that I think there was no ver no rhyme in it. That that's pretty rare in in modern okay. songwriting. Oh sure, because I'm a pretty good rhymer, you know. Yeah. I've written pretty good rhymes in songs. I mean, how many people have written a song? with a rhyme that went, I'd, I'd, I'd jump off, I'd jump right off a plane, I'd fight off half of Spain, I'd <laughs> Lake Poncha train if I could be closer to you. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Um, so, classic. Well, happy birthday, Robert Plant. Yes, indeed. The Big Log, is that a nickname that you have for him because of one of his songs or something? Or am I completely mixed up? Anyway, forget about Robert Plant. We're talking to Billy Vera, and I probably pronounced your name wrong after all that. I, with my accent, I think I pronounced it wrong. Billy Vera. <laughs> Damn Irish accent. Um, I also loved uh, Here Comes the Dawn. That song made me cry. Thank you. That's my attorney's favorite song for some reason. <sighs> well, it's pressuring me to try to get Gladys Knight or somebody to record it. She, I could hear her singing it. Oh, I wish she would, boy. She's a great singer. Oh, she yeah. She had the same birthday and the same year, although she looks a lot better at our age than I do. But, yeah, she still sings great. 
She she's one of the greatest singers. I mean, we we spoke on the phone about Sarah Vaughan and and um, Frank Sinatra and uh, uh, Jimmy Scott. Well, little Jimmy Scott, and you sang and were friends with little Jimmy Scott back in the day. Yeah, yeah, we were we were very good friends. I um, I produced reissues of some of his work, uh, his complete Savoy recordings, a little box set. I have that. Yes. And I did uh, his his complete Decca choral recordings from early in his career, and I did another one of some of his Atlantic recordings. So we we were we were pretty close. He used to come and see me sing, and I'd see him sing. You know, that's, and, uh, that's quite a compliment. Yeah. And the, a, the Atlantic um, the album Source. That's I yes. love his version of Day by Day. It's just killer. Day by Day. Oh, yeah, I I first heard that uh, when I. It was in the hay, as we say, with a young lady that I had met at a nightclub I performed at. And on the radio came Jimmy from that album, which was brand new at the time, singing Exodus, oh. which is a very long, long version. Yeah, it's beautiful, though. Yeah, you know, Joel Dornar, who you mentioned to me before, produced that album. That's right. And I got mixed up. I thought they were brothers, his father and son. On that album... There's only a small amount of tracks, like maybe six tracks on that album, but it's singing. Yeah. yeah. It's his finest singing for me. I mean, I did love his 50s output when he sang uh, Spinning Wheel, which was a hit for, I forget who had that hit. Spinning Wheel. Oh, oh the same song that, uh... oh, 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 you're thinking of Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune, I'm sorry, Wheel of Fortune, yeah. It's Carr did it, and uh, Johnny Hartman had the original version. That right. was a very much covered song. And Brilliant. one of my favorite singers uh, of all time, very fairly obscure guy, unfortunately, today, also recorded Wheel of Fortune, Arthur Prysock. I know that name, I really do, and I must ask my friend David Dash, he, he's an expert on all that stuff. Well, Arthur was a, a singer with uh, Buddy Johnson's band, and Buddy wrote great songs for Arthur. Uh, he had a deep baritone voice, kind of like uh, Eckstein. And, and in fact, I can do I can do both Eckstein and I can do Arthur. Everybody knows how the story goes. All the sort I care for you. I love Arthur. He wrote it at this moment, he, late in his life. He he loved it. He he, he recorded it. Oh, he yeah. recorded it. And it's funny. Yeah. Billy Eckstein did that same thing. Am I apologize? Yeah. Right side of the mouth. Oh, my heart. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> now, could you do Sarah Vaughan or is that asking too much? Oh, Sarah. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you did that at the end At the end of um, At This Moment. You did the falsetto, which I'm not even going to attempt. And you did it live. And then you went and did it live on TV many times. That is, that's out in the wind on your oh, own. Thank you. Well, you know, I grew up in New York at a time when uh, the doo-wop singers were very popular. Yeah. You know, the, the Cadillacs and the Drifters and the Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. And a lot of those guys used falsetto. That's so true. when I was learning how to sing, uh, we were singing on the street corners, you know, uh, hoping that the girls would walk by. And, you know, <laughs> we, I would sing falsetto. That's where I started singing falsetto. And I love your vibrato too. Not to, I, I, I'm, I'm being a fan here, but I don't care. That's what I am. Your vibrato was just, it was, it was slightly wired, but it was unique. And you really hear it on, on, on Here Comes the Dawn as well. Here comes the dawn. Got that crying now. <laughs> That's my job, man. Yeah, I'm no Billy Vera. Okay, let's talk about your, your, um, well, your memoir, uh, Harlem to Hollywood, and the, uh, the new book that you just released, Rip It Up, the specialty record story. Could you tell us a little? Uh, yeah, well, Harlem to Hollywood is a memoir. People had been asking me and bugging me, you got so many great stories, when are you going to write a book about yourself? I, oh, I don't want to do that. And I just resisted and resisted until finally I said, "If just if they'll just shut up, I'll write the book. You know? <laughs> so I, I finally figured out an angle to write it from which didn't make me look like an egomaniac, you know? And um, so it, it, as I, once I got going, it, it came out okay. The Harlem 
comes from, I, I first got known uh, singing at the Apollo Theater. Uh, so that's Harlem. With Judy and, Clay, right? Yes, Judy Clay and I had a hit record called Storybook Children in 1968. And uh, we, uh, we got a booking at the Apollo before anybody had seen our picture. And so I walk in the theater for a rehearsal. In those days, you did a seven-day week, five shows a day. And uh, uh, Honey Coles, who the great dancer, was, was the stage manager. And Honey said, uh, oh, gee, uh, Harlem hasn't seen you yet. <laughs> That's a great line. Yeah. He said, so I got an idea. I said, what's that? He said, you know, it, when, you, when you make your entrances, he said, Judy, you enter from stage right, and Judy, Billy, you enter from stage left, and you let her take three steps out from the wings before you make your entrance. He said, and watch what happens. So I, you know, I go one, two, three, enter. I hear 1,500 people gasp, and I hear them going, that's him? That's him, that skinny little white boy. Is. <laughs> and, uh, and they were kind of worried about that whether we would go over well, you know, a, a white guy with a black woman. Uh, but however, they loved us. And this was one month after Dr. Martin Luther King got killed. And, uh, and there were riots going on across the Hudson River in uh, New Jersey, in Newark. But they, they loved us at the Apollo. So after the first show, he, uh, he comes up to our dressing room. He said, I'm going to change up the show. He said, I'm putting you two on right before the star. He said, because ain't nobody going to follow you two. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. What, what was it? There was, there was an actor, I, I can't remember the guy's name, but that said something to you later on in the show. I'm, I'm not giving you much background information on it, but he said something very complimentary to you about belonging to the black community and being accepted by the black community. Oh, well, there was a gentleman uh, named Ralph Cooper. That's, that's him. Unfortunately unknown today. He was a very famous black actor, and he had been on the show at the Apollo in 1934 when they first opened the theater to black people. And so... 20 years after we appeared there, I went up there with Lou Rawls, who was do, uh, booked to do a benefit show. So we go in the back stage door on 124th, uh, 6th Street, and it, the whole little vestibule there was crowded with people shoulder to shoulder. And there was Ralph Cooper. And he's talking to Lou, and he keeps looking over Lou's shoulder at me. You know, not because I was the only white guy there, but just he was trying to remember who I placed me, you know. Yeah. And then finally he says, ah, Billy Vera. He said, come here, boy. And he said, he puts his arms around me and he says, welcome home, son. He said, he said, I want to tell everybody here in this room what this man did for our people. He said, you know, your picture is still on the wall down in the lobby, and it will always be there because of what you did. And I, I tell you, I was so moved, you know. I, I, was, I was like fighting back tears, you know, that, because the people remembered and that you did something that may have mattered, you know. And, and you didn't set out to do something as a big, big, uh, you know, sweeping gesture. You were basically a musician who saw no difference in you and a woman with a different colored skin and you recorded, you know, I love country girl, city man. And I view that as black girl, white guy. It was the, the only way people could, you know, it, it wasn't for a few more years until really, uh, you know, Marvin Gaye said it as it was supposed to be said about skin color. But you sang with, these great songs with Judy Kay. I love Reaching for the Moon. Did Chip Taylor uh, write that? Chip and I wrote that. You yeah. wrote it with him, ah. Yeah. Yeah. Chip and I were uh, pretty much writing as partners at that time. And uh, we, the first song we wrote uh, became a hit. 
for a girl named Barbara Lewis. I know her. A song called Make Me Belong to You and on Atlantic Records. And that was our entree to Atlantic Records and to the great Jerry Wexler, who was the, you know. Legendary producer. Legendary producer. And so when we, we, we decided to write a duet for a couple of Atlantic artists, and that's how we wrote Storybook Children. And we brought it to Jerry, made a demo with a, some girl. And so Jerry pounded it. Can I curse? Yeah, go ahead, focus. <laughs> so, so he pounds his fist on the desk and he says, man, that's a fucking smash. <laughs> that's Jerry Wexler. Yeah, he says, get rid of the girl on the demo and I'll record you. <laughs> and, it, it, and like, I'm like, Okay, that's one thing to have my name in little tiny letters under Barbara Lewis's name as a songwriter, but to have my name as the singer, I mean, it was like a dream come true. You know, all my favorite singers were on Atlantic, you know, uh, Ray Charles, uh, Joe Turner, Laverne Baker, Aretha Franklin. I mean, to be on Bobby Darren, you know, ah. to be on that label was like it. So we had to audition girls. Well, the song was not written as some interracial love statement. It was about a guy in love with a married woman. You know, it, it, it had nothing to do with, with, with race. But so we auditioned some white girl, some black girl, just one, we were looking for somebody with the right, that, whose voice blended with mine. And we, we've, we've, I was friends with Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells at the time. I played guitar for them a lot. And, uh, so I, I, one of the girls in the group, Nona Hendricks, had a voice I thought would match. Great singer. And she, cause she had a deeper voice than, than Patty. So we, I, I called her up in Philadelphia. I said, Hey, Nona, you want to make a record with me? You're on Atlantic. I'm going to be on Atlantic. You know, there's no contractual problems. She said, yeah. So she comes to New York. We record storybook children together. And then their manager said, was afraid that if we had a hit, it would break up the group. So we had a goodbye Nona. So now we audition more girls. And then finally, Jerry Wexler suggested Judy Clay, who was a, a cousin, uh, an adopted cousin of Dion and Dee Dee Warwick and, and a niece of Sissy Houston. Yeah. Dion and Dee Dee's mother, uh, sister. All from Newark. Sissy was the sister of Dion and Dee Dee's mother. And they were all in a group called the Drink Art Singers, a gospel group. So we listened to Judy, and uh, we loved her voice, and uh, we recorded it with her, and it became a hit record. Well, you said about the voices blending. When I first heard that song, when you hear people sing it in harmony, you, the, the voices either blend or they don't. And when they don't right. blend, it's not so bad, but when they blend, it's just... It, it, there's no word. There are no words to describe what you hear, and that's what I hear when I hear, it, particularly um, the, the song, "The Moon." My brain is gone here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the last song that we wrote that we recorded together. What had happened was, uh, she was signed to Stax Records, and I was signed to Atlantic, and then the distribution deal between Stax and Atlantic ended. Uh. We could no longer record together, and at that point. Uh, Wexler, we were playing the Apollo when when I got the call, and Wexler said, "I found a song for you. Don't worry, for your for your first solo session." He said, "This it's a, on Bobby Goldsboro's album. It's called With Pen in Hand." He said, "It's a great song. I'll, I'll send it up to the theater if you like it. We'll do it." He said, "When do you finish?" Uh, I said, "We finish Thursday night." He said, "I'm booking the studio for Friday morning, 9 a.m." And he said, I'll have a reef from our Dean write a, a, a big orchestra chart for you. And so we go in there and, and I recorded the song. And over the weekend, he had test pressings made and mailed out to every radio station in the country. I mean, that's how great a, a promotion guy Jerry Wexler was. Incredible. You know, and so, you know, he knew how to get a record played. Yeah, I've seen some of his interviews. One of my one of the stories I love, and you might know the story behind this, but George Michael, the, the famous English singer, he went, you know, when he kind of went solo, he was doing that big hit. He had um, 
Careless Whisper. So they brought yeah. him to Atlantic Records and uh, Jerry Wexler produced it. And he didn't like it and he went and produced it himself. I wonder what Jerry thought of that. You know, that, that happened to Jerry another time. <clears throat> you know, after, after Linda Ronstadt's career started to go downhill a little bit, uh, Jerry, by that time, was working for Warner Brothers, who had bought, purchased Atlantic. And uh, so he, he decided to do an album with her, uh, sort of a Billie Holiday-esque album in, with songs of that style. And, and, he, and he recorded about five or six tracks uh, with Linda singing those kind of songs, but with a small band, you know, six, seven pieces, right. like Billie Holiday used to sing with. And, it, and nobody was happy with it. So they, 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 they tossed those in the garbage. And, and they were pretty good. I liked them because he played them for me. Uh, then they got Nelson Riddle. And then, of course, that worked for her, for Linda. And then, of course, she, it became such a popular album, she did two more after that yeah. with Nelson Riddle. And, of course, for the, for the listeners, Nelson Riddle being the famous um, chart writer, arranger of Sinatra fame in the, in the 50s. And incredible. He was so good that they released albums of his arrangements with no singing on them. Yeah. You, like, you know what happened in Mont Monterey is an incredible arrangement. Yes, he was a brilliant arranger. Yeah. yeah. He was the best. I mean, there was there was Don Costa, there was uh, Billy May, and people like that. They were also great. But he was what Sinatra was as the top singer. To me, Nelson Middle was the. I, I'm in full agreement with you on yeah. that. Yeah, they were all good. Gordon Jenkins, you know, I mean, they were they were all excellent arrangers, top of the pile. But Nelson Riddle was the top of the top of the pile. He was, and uh, Axel Stordal, I, I thought, was great too. Yes. And but but by that time he he was his his style was passe. It was, 40s. you know, the first session because Frank was loyal to him, and, and the first session he did for Capital in 1953, he he insisted upon using Axel Stordahl. Yep, and uh, it it didn't it just sounded a little old fashioned. Unfortunately, they yeah. they said listen, yeah. they said Nelson's doing great stuff with Nat Cole. Why don't you give him a shot? And that's when it clicked. Did, did you read um, Will Friedwald's book on Sinatra? Sure. What a book. Fact, I, just, I just finished uh, Will's book on Nat Cole. Oh. Which is excellent. Great writer. That, to me, that's the definitive book. I say to people, forget the mafia, forget um, a Ava Gardner and all this gossip and crap and his anger. If you want to know about the art, read Will Friedwald's book, which I think is uh, The Art of the Song. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. And there's a story in that as well where on the first session with Nelson Riddle, um, they did it, they did a rundown of one of his charts for one of the songs. This is around 53. And when it stopped, Sinatra said, Hey kid, come out, let's talk outside. And he brought him outside at the window in the studio. And they could hear him talking and the, you know, the young 26-year-old Nelson Riddle listening to the master. And they they reckoned what he was telling them was how to arrange to not step on a singer. Right. You know, and yeah. so, Billy, would you agree that that Sinatra produced his own records when all was said and done? I think he had the last word. Right. You know, a lot of the, 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 the I don't want to use the word ruthless or aggressive, but uh, assertive artists like, like Frank and like Ray Charles is another one. They, they insist upon things being done their way. And, and they'll make suggestions. Uh, and, you know, uh, it took me a long, long time to learn that lesson because I was more of a, I was more of a, a unsure of myself in, 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 in something like production that I didn't really know about. I put my hands sometimes in people that really didn't get me, you know, uh, you know, cause my songs are, are, uh, require um, some delicacy and 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 a, and, a, and a wide sense of emotion and sound as well. You know, shortly after I came on the scene, that whole Stax Bolt thing in rhythm and blues became popular, and 
you know, the, the volume started up here and stayed up here. Where I was used to listening to Ray Charles records where, you know, you might, or Count Basie, where you, one moment you might be soft and the next minute your band would be blasting. And, and, and you had to direct the band in that way and direct the arrangements in that way. And I didn't have the confidence at, as a young fellow to do that. So I had to rely on, on luck. Right. You know, that a Jerry Wexler would come in the studio and say, no, he needs it like this. You know? uh, Jerry Wexler, with all great respect, incredible producer. I don't think that he had that in his, um, his, in, in, in his skill quite, you know, like, like you have. Um, my my, my mind just... You, met, you like my song, Hopeless Romantic. Love that. I meant to mention that. They're my three top favorites. Jerry produced that record, Hopeless Romantic. Oh, well, I take back what I said. <laughs> and and I, I, I remained friends with him until the end of his life. And, uh, you know, he'd call me up with the latest dirty jokes. or he'd, <laughs> Tell us one. <laughs> and he would say, you know, who else can I talk to about Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys but you and Jimmy Lunsford, you know? So we would we would talk, but he said he he maintained to the end of his life that Hopeless Romantic was one of the five best records that he ever produced. Well, listen, it's an incredible song. We're gonna we're gonna actually probably play a video in a minute. Okay, we're gonna show um, uh, Billy Vera and the Beaters singing his classic hit at this moment. Remember, this is live. Check this out. What did you think I would do at this moment when you're standing before me with tears in your eyes trying to tell me I found you another and you just don't love me Just 
Isn't that just incredible? That song, that song got me through my fourth heartache. Like I, I said this to Billy on the phone the other day. That song, I I think taught men about how to break up and not be angry. You know, ah, oh, just listen. You know the story. Anyway, that was uh, that was incredible, Billy. That's fine vocal. Thank you very much. And that's dynamics. And we were talking about that before the video. Um, you know, uh, Sinatra at the Sands, one of his greatest live albums. Track number three on it. Sonny Payne is on drums. Credible drummer. I actually yeah. thought it was Irv Kotler for years. Irv Kotler's incredible. But it's actually Sonny Payne. And um, dude, what's the song? I've got you under my skin. So the breakdown that he got Nelson Riddle to write into that based on uh, Stan Kenton's famous something degrees north, something degrees west. That is what you call dynamic brilliance. He's hitting the rim shot and then he hits the full drum. I lose my mind when the whole band comes in. Yeah, Sonny Payne, I had the, the uh, good fortune to see Sonny Payne live when I was young with, with Count Basie. My mother took me to see it. And I'm telling you, the, the sound that came rolling off that stage, you know, it's like, it was like a wave. <laughs> I know, it kills me. A tsunami. <laughs> and yet, and then he would go down on a song like uh, Lil Darlin, and and they would play in a whisper, you know, and then boom, it was just the dynamics. The dynamics, the they're missing in today's music, Billy. They're missing. Well, that was a big influence on me. And when I, when I moved to Hollywood and, and started, you know, put together the beaters, these were guys who were like only about three years younger than myself, but they were raised playing Otis Redding and Sam and Dave records where it started here and stayed here dynamically and I, I i had to really i had to really school them you know and and say listen no this song when you play my songs here at this point here you have to get like almost whispering yeah and then you get louder and then you get and and it, it took it took a long time to get them to to be able to play that way yeah uh, you know and and you, you kind of almost need guys with a jazz background Rather than rock and roll guys. That's exactly play. it. Now oh, you, you, know, you have a song called School Me, Fool Me. You just, you just reminded me of that. Someone will school you, someone will cool you. That's on them um, by request. Yes. That's a swinger. It, all, all of by request plus uh, several unreleased tracks are on a CD called uh, The Best of Billy Vera and the Beaters. And there's, there's all those songs that you like from by request and some other pretty great songs that had never been, had never seen the light of day well, before. Well, www.amazon.com, Billy Vera and the Beaters. That's going to be what I'm doing later on. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, uh, we spoke a bit earlier about um, Duke Ellington. Could you tell me a little bit about your feelings on Duke? Because I love Duke Ellington, and I know you me do. Too. I'm a major Duke Ellington collector. Uh, and it started out when my mother, my mother was a singer, uh, on the Perry Como show, uh, background singer. Letters, we get letters, we get stacks, <laughs> and stacks of letters. So anyway, she, she used to bring home albums from Sinatra to Nat Cole to whoever. And then one day she brings home a Duke Ellington album called Ellington Uptown. And on that album was a great version of Take the A-Train with a vocal by Betty Roche an incredible saxophone solo. It's about a five, almost six minute record. Incredible sax solo by Paul Gonzalez. I know him. And it's, it's just an amazing record. I mean, to this day, I played this record when my son was little. To this day, my son can sing the horn parts on that song. Wow. <laughs> you know? That's yeah. how much you played it. He picked me up in the car one day to take me somewhere. 
and 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 that's he had that song on his playlist, you know, in the in the car, and and, and I'm I, I look around and he's singing the horn parts to that great song. <laughs> anyway, from that point onward, Duke Ellington was my main man, uh, and I just I love the ground he walks on. In fact, on his 100th birthday, I had the uh, honor and the pleasure being asked to compile and produce a CD of, of uh, Duke's uh, works from his, that were owned by EMI catalog, which would be his Capitol songs, his, uh, his one trio album he made with, uh, with Max Roach and, and Mingus. Max Roach, huh? And I, I, included, I included a couple of songs from the album he made with Louis Armstrong. So, you know, it's, it's, I, it was such a thrill to be able to choose those great Duke Ellington songs and put them out to the world. Speaking of which, I would love to see you do a, an, an, an Ellington album. Like, you've already done a big band album. I'd love to hear you do a Duke Ellington tribute album. Be I've often thought about it. I do a couple of uh, Duke songs. I do uh, um, uh, the one that Billy Strayhorn, one of the ones that Billy Strayhorn wrote for him called My, my Little Brown Book on my big band album, Billy Vera Big Band Jazz. And uh, I do another one of Duke's songs, too, on there. And on, in live with my big band, I do uh, um, uh, the one Al Hibbler sang so well. Mm. Well, I heard you singing yeah. When I Fall in Love. Wait, sorry, what? say again, Billy, sorry. I'm having an old man moment. Hey, don't worry, but I heard you singing When I Fall in Love, and I know it was the only time you sang it, and your phrasing is top shelf on that. There's one particular part in it, I'm like, holy shit, that's, that's Sinatra phrasing. It's, it's, oh. it's so good. Uh, Johnny Carson, um, you've yeah. been on that show nine times, and I, I, tell me if I'm right or wrong when I say this. Somebody asked um, Johnny Carson... Uh, what he thought of Billy Vera, and he said, well, he's my second favorite singer after Tony Bennett. That, that is true. I was told that by a, fr a dear friend of mine um, who wrote Carson's monologues, you know, the little comedy bits he did before, at the beginning of each show yeah. for 30 years. And he, he said, he said, that's true. He said, Johnny always said that you were his second favorite singer. In the world. Well, I've watched him introduce you, and, and he actually said it in one of the introductions, like, oh, well, I think it was New Year's Eve, maybe 90, 87 or 89, and he said, uh, we got, you know, we got him, we've got uh, Billy Bear and the Beaters, we really love him here. And he, and he was so sincere. My wife asked me to ask you um, how he was as a person. Was he as nice off camera as he was on camera? Well, you know, his, you know, we all work differently. Uh, before the show, he didn't he didn't uh, socialize with the guests because he wanted to save it for the show. Right. That was I mean that that was his method of working. Uh, but he was he was very nice. You know he knew my dad from uh, when the show was in New York. You know my dad was an announcer on NBC, so he he and Ed and Ed uh, McMahon both knew my my dad, and so. You know, it was kind of like that. That was a connection that we had. You yeah, know, yeah. You know, however minor. You met him probably when you were young as well, right? I mean, when you were a boy. No, I never. I, I didn't. No, I didn't meet Carson until I, I was the first time I was on his show. But uh, I did go to the, my mom. Did take me to the Perry Como show uh, on on uh, like on Saturdays when they to the dress rehearsal, and she kept an autograph book for me. Uh, brown leather with a zipper, and and all the guests that came on the show, she would, would you give an autograph for my little boy, you know? And I, so I have I have autographs by, you know, everybody from Louis Armstrong to Liberace to Roy Rogers, you know. I mean, I gotta get your. I want your autograph. <laughs> right. Um, well, I, you told me a story about one of Sinatra's ladies um played at this moment for him. Could you tell the listeners about that? Yes. Again, it came through Facebook. Uh, a woman, uh, you know, introduced herself to me and she said, I, I was, I was one of Frank's main girlfriends. And, uh, you know, and, and this same woman, 
She also produced a, a tribute to songwriters at the famous Wiltern Theater here in Los Angeles. And I was on the show. And unbeknownst to me, she filmed the whole show. And then she told me when you you know my whatever it was fifteen twenty years later that she had this film and she said I, I I played it for Frank one night and he said my God he said who is this guy he said why doesn't the whole world know who this man is he said this is one of the greatest performances I ever heard in my life or ever saw in my life he said, and he made her play it again and again. And again, and he was known for that when he loved something, he would play it day in, day out. And, and then every time he came to visit her, he would make her play that video. And, and of course, by the time I met her on, on Facebook, anyway, she, you know, he was already had passed on. I said, my God, I, if, if only I could have met him and, and known that he felt that way about me. You know, it would have been such a thrill because, I mean, here I was 12 years old. You know, my mom brought home songs for young lovers and album. songs for lovers that might still my two favorite Sinatra albums. Masterpieces. Masterpieces is right. And, uh, and, and, you know, she said, you know, she said, when I was a young girl starting out as a singer in Cleveland, Ohio, she said, uh, Frank came in the club one night and he took me home. I said, really, my mom? He, you know, he took you home? She said, oh, no. She said, he, was, he was a perfect gentleman. Listen to this. He said, he didn't try any funny stuff. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. Thank you. <laughs> um, and in club, she said, Duke Ellington came in one night and accompanied her on the piano. Oh. And so she, she, she got the around some biggies you know I love how you speak about your mother I said that to you on the phone you can just hear it in your tone you've got such great love for your mother I'm from a from a family where our mother is greatly loved and deified and you know my wife even says you you know Rita Rita Dempsey's my mother she's the queen well so she is you know <laughs> well she was very good to me when when uh, the 70s came and music changed pretty radically uh, and I could not for the life of me figure out how to fit in with what was going on in popular music. You know, I was a what used to be called a blue-eyed soul singer, you know, and that was out of style. What what was I gonna do? I couldn't be a disco singer, I couldn't be a heavy metal singer, you know, I, I, <laughs> I a singer songwriter, you know, you know, like a Jackson Brown or something. I, I just couldn't find my way, and I was playing survival gigs, you know, almost the whole decade of the 70s. And, and so, so she let me live at home. I had to pay her rent, of course, but I played with my little band. I, I, I made my band down to three pieces sometimes, and, uh, and we worked survival gigs. I mean, a typical, here's a typical week for us during the 70s, Monday night, some mafia club out in New Jersey with a, with a topless dancer in a cage above the stage to compete with. <laughs> and pick up an oldies group, you know, uh, coasters or the drifters or somebody. And then Tuesday night would be uh, firemen's and policemen's bar in the Bronx, you know, where, uh, you know, you, you'd have a, a, it was maid's night off with a lot of Irish housekeepers all singing sweet carola <laughs> i hate that song <laughs> it was horrible and then wednesday night we drive out to long island at some uh singles bar where everybody's dressed in polyester <laughs> <laughs> and terrible button chops and everything thursday night we would play up in near connecticut uh on the new york side of the border at a hippie bar so all these hippies would come in, and here we are playing soul music. But you know what? They loved it. Yep. Loved it. I'd, be, I'd play a Chuck Berry song, and I, and I, I always talk between songs, because I'm old school. That's what we did it back then. And the rock groups didn't talk. They just play one song. So they, they weren't used to somebody that would talk to them. And I'd say, here's a, here's a song by Chuck Berry. And then after the set was over, they'd come up to me and say, wow. We thought that was a Rolling Stones song. 
They didn't know. Or I'd say, Junior Parker, you know, the great blues singer. Oh, we thought that was a Grateful Dead song. You know? <laughs> and so they, they began to follow us to these other clubs. So <laughs> in the midst of some, a bunch of firemen and, and police officers, there's a, suddenly a big table of about eight or 10 hippies. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and it somehow, you know, they, they accepted them. And they were like, uh, they, they became our little followers, you know, and it was, it was, anyway, that was the seventies for me. Yeah. Okay. We're going to show a, a video. Uh, this video is Billy with Billy Vera on the beater singing, uh, here comes the dawn. Now if this song doesn't move you or make you cry. Check your pulse. You're dead. Check this out. Okay. Now, music time. First guest is a veteran rock and roller, both as a singer and songwriter, and he and the band is going to be touring around the country this summer. Matter of fact, they open at Harris up in Lake Tahoe the 3rd uh, and 4th of July, and their album, by request, has officially gone gold. Now, what's gone gold? Does that mean how many? A million copies? No. 500,000, I think. Half a million copies. Yeah. Not bad. Would you welcome Billy Vera and the Beaters? Billy! <laughs>
Okay, um, I remember listening to that song in my flat. I lived in Dublin in a place uh, called South Circle Road with the guitar player in the band and I cried my eyes out listening to that song night after night and I, I'm, I'm going to stop because I'll cry again. That's just, what, that's maybe even my top favourite of yours, Billy. Incredible song. Thank you. You know, the, the, as an interesting, as hopefully interesting aside, uh, that's the one completely autobiographical song I, I think I ever wrote. Um, usually when I write, I, 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 I maybe take something you tell me, something I saw on a TV show, something I read in a book, you know, and I mix it all up like a gumbo and create a, a work of fiction or semi-fiction. But in, in the case of Here Comes the Dawn, that perfectly describes where I was at, at that time when it was over between me and the girl, but I still had hope that she might change her mind. And so to capture that small window, window of time, I think that's, to me, that's the, the part of the, the thing that makes that song as good as it is. Well, it, it spoke to me like like you wouldn't believe. It's, I mean, when you think about it, I was 17, heartbroken, the hope she'd come back every day, but doing nothing about it, thinking about it, but doing nothing, not going up and having the balls to say, I'm still crazy about you. And there you are, you know, huge fame as you had your two number ones and you're speaking to me from another world and another time. You didn't know who I was. And here I am interviewing yeah. you. So it's uh, it's an amazing the way life can happen. So um, there was something I wanted to ask you before we do the Proust questionnaire, and I can't even remember what it was because I'm an idiot. The oh, the books, yes. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about the uh, Rip It Up and Harlem to Hollywood. Well, Rip It Up, the specialty record story, was uh, I was approached by uh, a, a book publisher, uh, BMG, who was doing a series of, of small books on independent record labels, old and new. And so for the fourth one in their series, they asked me to do one on specialty records uh, because I, I, I used to work as a consultant for specialty. I put out about 50 uh, CDs of their, of their catalog. And um, so I knew, the, I knew the story. And I was friends, I am still friends, with the founder of the company, Art Roop, who is today 102 years old. Happy birthday. <laughs> and you and me put together, you know. Yeah. So... Anyway, so I, I, I wrote that, and it's, it's been very well received by the record collector community. And the, the you know, especially had Little Richard, early Sam Cooke, Lloyd Price, and a lot of wonderful, Percy Mayfield, one of, a lot of wonderful artists. I love, so I love Sam Cooke. And real brief story, yeah. I'll tell you this in 30 seconds. 
bought an album by Little Richard back in when I was a teenager, around the same time as I had your album. Loved it. Rip It Up and Long Tall Sally and all that stuff. And it, with the passion, the fire in it was incredible. So, you know, I moved on and I came over here to live. I got married and one day I was at the store, you know, like getting groceries like two o'clock in the morning, like us musicians always do. And I see the selling CDs and I see Little Richard. I'm like, I don't have the album with me. I don't have a record player. I bought the album, I put it on, and I said, after listening to it, it's not as good as it's not as good as I thought it was. What's wrong here? And I'm never wrong about music, because like Quincy Jones said, the bumps never lie, the goosebumps never lie. So I said, Some, something's wrong here. So I looked at the at the liner notes and it said re-recorded in the 80s because he lost. Oh. And that made me feel had to be careful. Yeah, but what, what was good for me, Billy, was my ear. I, I, I pride myself on having a good ear for great music like yours. I know it. And I, I felt good. I had that moment of, you know, a little bit of hubris, but hey. And Sam <laughs> Cooke, what a singer, Sam Cooke. Well, specialty recorded Sam when he was very young and he was uh, doing gospel. Yep, I have those albums. And they did, um, and they recorded his first secular uh, songs. Uh, so... That was so specialty was very important label, what, you know. And in in, were specialty connected to Keen, Keen Records? No, no. Specialty was only specialty. It's all right. And now you're Hollywood to Harlem. Tell us a little about that before we go to the Proust questionnaire. Harlem to Hollywood. Harlem to Hollywood. Uh, it, so it's my life story, mostly not not the not the juicy stuff. <laughs> the stuff. I, I'm too much of a gentleman to talk about. You are the, 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 the actresses that you meet when you come to Hollywood. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it just, it just tells the Billy Vera story. You know, it starts with my parents and their story and goes all the way through. And people like it. They say it's well-written. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we, we mostly do when we have Americans on, um, we do the press questionnaire when we have people like me that are immigrants, we do my version of it. So we'll do the press questionnaire. And the basic idea is, you know, First thing that comes to mind, and if we stumble on a question, we move forward. Is that cool? We may do a lot of stumbling. <laughs> well, you see, I, I'm always stumbling, but you know what? It keeps it real, and it keeps it just like two people having a conversation. Great. As far as I'm concerned. Okay. First question on the Proust questionnaire for, for Billy Vera. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh, boy. I guess, uh, you know, the ideal thing is to say... Uh, is to is to spend a spend a weekend with my kids. Excellent. You know? What is your greatest achievement or achievements? I think uh, I think probably having written a song that has lasted that that will outlast my lifetime. Uh, I, I I think I think of people. You know, the great Burt Bacharachs and Irving Berlins who have written a hundred of those. But to have written one is a pretty good thing, you know. Well, it's one, it's so, one more than I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Okay, yeah. which living person do you most admire? <clears throat> living person? Yeah. Oh, boy, that's tough. Because, you know, I'm, I'm at the age now where most of the people I admired are dead. <laughs> Wow, I, I, I may have to come back. Okay, to no that worry. One. What is your current state of mind? Uh, uh, gratitude. Excellent. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? Most overrated virtue is um, mm, um, self righteousness. Excellent. What is the quality you most like in a person? Loyalty. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? I most overuse. Uh, I'll say, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica uses that. Yep. She always <laughs> says that. Holy shit. Yes, Jessica. That's it. Um, what is your most marked characteristic? My mo most marked characteristic? Hmm. Uh, I know what the word means, but I, I, to apply it to oneself is, is hmm, wow. Uh, I, think, I think my, uh, my, 
not patience, but um, my ability to, to to carry on in, in adversity. Okay. Well, you are you are a, a a legend and a trooper and somebody who's who's been around through the seventies, as you said, with with survival gigs. Okay. Couple more questions. If you were to die and come back as a person, or thing, what or who would it be? You know, I've never envied anyone enough to want to change places with that's them. That's a great. That's a great answer. So, so it wouldn't be a person. Okay. You know, I I, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind being uh, a great lover. <laughs> Casanova. A great, a little bit of a Casanova, yeah. Well, thankfully, you're a singer and and, and renowned. Okay, uh, which history? I've, I've always said, if I wasn't a singer, I'd still be a virgin. <laughs> Well, you know what? I'm not a virgin, but I hope to be one day. <laughs> Which historical figure do you most identify with? Oh, identify with? Um, it's a tough one, right? I know who I admire. I admire two people a lot. I think the two greatest men in the 20th century were Winston Churchill and... Harry S. Truman. In fact, I hate politicians. I so do I. But I love Harry Truman. Uh, yep. I, I recently read a, a thousand-page biography of him, and I think he was the greatest president we ever had. In fact, the only one I like. Wow. Well, I'm, Billy, I'm with you. I hate politicians. I call them. I call them the plunderers in power. But we don't do politics. We said that we wouldn't. No. Believe me, I could right. forever. Okay, the last question on the Proust questionnaire. Uh, do you have a motto? And if so, what is your motto? You know, I do, and I, I forgot it right now. <laughs> I, have a, I have a really good motto. I'd say so. Know? But my mother gave me a, a, a good motto. She said, you know, you're going to be in show business. She said, she said, it's a business of peaks and valleys. So always live below your means. Did you do that? I did. Brilliant. I did. I mean, so I, I, mean, I went through times when I was dirt poor. I mean, I, 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 lived, I lived in one room with no heat, no plumbing. It was so cold in the winter that I had to put my dry cleaning plastic up on the wall with, with tape to keep the cold out. I had to buy a, a bedpan from the drugstore to, to relieve myself. Right. So I've been poor. Uh, and yet I never wanted for anything because I lived by my mother, the motto my mother gave me, which was always live below your means. You, you're, in, in many ways, you're a rarity in the music business with not drinking, not smoking, oh. not drugging, but you're, you're definitely a rarity there. Okay, we have two more things. One is we're gonna ask you the question, which is the name of our show. What is America to you, Billy Vera? America to me, I happen to love my country and I love, the fact that I'm free to do what I want, to go where I want, to be what I want, and that I can be anything that I put my mind to in 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 this great country. We're both we're both immigrants, Canada, Ireland, and I couldn't agree. I adore this country. You know what I think? I've said this before, and I'll say it till I'm blue or till somebody kills me. I love the spirit of Americans. I'm not talking about yes. politicians or big business or, or anything. Oh. I'm talking about the, the, the guy who moves the snow in the winter, the, the, the school teacher, like Sinatra says in the house I live in. That's the America. The yes. spirit is beyond incredible. I love Americans. My wife's American. My kids are American. My dogs are American. I love you. Okay, so this is something new. I didn't even tell Jessica. I'm going to try to get a selfie because, I'm, you know, a... <laughs> And instead of a, and it's called an ISO selfie as opposed to an isolation an isolation selfie. So how are we gonna? If you pull forward a little bit, Jessica, you can sure. yeah, let's do it like this. God knows what we're gonna look like. I don't know what it's gonna I'm be gonna... like, Billy, but we got a selfie with Billy Vera. Billy, I, I enjoyed so greatly talking to you today. I don't consider it an interview. I consider that we 
I was talking to a great human being. We had a great conversation on the phone. I feel like I've known you all my life and I have through song. We can't thank you enough for giving us the time to come, to, to come on and talk to us at What Is America To You. Well, thank you for having me, Derek. I appreciate it. Jessica, it's nice to meet you too. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you. You're a gentleman. Uh, great, just wonderful to have you. Enjoy the rest of the day and hopefully we'll see you soon and we'll hear that uh, Duke Ellington album. Have a great day, Billy. Thank you. Okay, of course, that was Billy Vera of Billy Vera and the Beaters. Uh, fant- that, that was just a, mo- a great moment for me. That was awesome, yeah. It's like, That's- yeah, like this, like I said it to him in the interview, it was like reaching across decades and he, he got me through it. Um, so don't forget and check out Billy's books, uh, his memoir, uh, Har- Hollywood to Har- Harlem to Hollywood, and his new book, Rip It Up, The Specialty Record Story. And check out uh, his, his big band, Billy, Billy Vera, big band album, and my favourite album, Billy Vera and the Beaters, by request. Okay. Thanks for listening in. Before you go, if you haven't already, please subscribe to What Is America To You and give us a like. And also continue to comment in the videos. If you have any stories or memories about Billy or any of the people he mentioned, talk about it. We love the conversation. Okay, from me and of course from Jessica, on the wrong side of the camera, eventually we'll get her here and I'll make the tea. (laughs) In my Charlie Chaplin cup. We'll talk about that again. Um, From Jessica and from me, Derek Dempsey, your host at What Is America To You. Goodbye for now. Driving along, minding my own business. Heading east through the Kentucky rain. There on the radio, Johnny Cash was singing. I hurt myself just to see if I still feel pain.